I'm back in Arizona, Rube. Have you found my Amex card? That's the big question. I have not found your Amex card. Uh, I have seen a ton of uh, Rafi billboards. <laughs> um, I'm trying some of like flying into the airport and like walking through the airport. I knew exactly where to go. I knew how to get to the rental car place. I almost could close my eyes and drive to the Biltmore. I've been here so many times. Well, you know, if you're going to be somewhere three times in about six months, there are worse places than Phoenix. That's true. Yeah. This is Eagle Eye Podcast. He's Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. First day of owners meetings down here in Phoenix. A lot to get to. Howie Roseman spoke with us this afternoon. Uh, a lot of interesting information. Now we're still expecting to talk to Nick Sirianni on Tuesday morning and then Jeff Lorry later on Tuesday afternoon. So there'll be more news coming out uh, over the next day or so. But uh, I thought a lot of good stuff from Howie today. Yeah, it seemed like it. Uh, he seemed uh, relaxed and talkative, chatty, a little chatty, Howie. Yeah, you'll like this before we get into the the meat of what was said. A bunch of guys were using their phones to record. This was an all uh, all audio uh, availability, so no cameras, um, no TV cameras, no iPhone shooting. But a lot of guys are using their phones as their recording devices. We're in that hot sun. A lot of them overheated. They didn't get the full transcript. Me and my old, uh, where is it? The old trusty recording device did not overheat. We're good to go. There you go. Nothing like uh, 20 year old technology. And it's a win for caveman technology for sure. Uh, we have a lot to talk about from Howie. Uh, Jalen Hurts contract potentially coming. I uh, kind of did an overview of a lot of their moves so far this offseason. And, and I thought the most transparent thing was him talking about CJ Gardner Johnson and how he ended up leaving here in free agency because I don't think that was the plan. I think they really did prioritize keeping CJ and it just didn't work out that way. Yeah. And I mean, we haven't talked to Howie since that all happened, but um, his account of it was pretty much what we thought they, they made an offer and CJ wasn't, didn't want it, didn't approve it, wanted more money. He moved on and they were not in a position where they could sit around and wait. Uh, And, you know, I, I don't think there was, there was no personality clash. It was nothing like that. It was they had to find a safety, and they couldn't wait because if you have a plan B, you wait. Now maybe you lose plan A and plan B and plan C. So uh, I, I totally get that. And and I think Howie was transparent with all the agents about, look, this is our situation, and uh, there's only so many guys we can bring back, and if they don't want to, I don't know, if they can't accept our initial offer, that's fine. You can move on, but we've got to move on too. Um, and the Eagles are not in a position to to, to play the waiting game with, with CJ. Yeah, and they thought they gave him a fair offer. It was an offer that he didn't have anywhere else, and I think that's verified by the offer he ended up taking in Detroit. But uh, and, and how we also brought up the fact that like they have this Jalen Hurts eventual extension kind of hanging over them, and that, that limits what they can do as well. They're happy to be in that position, but it limits what they can do this offseason and going forward, like the way they're going to build this team. Uh, And like he said, he said, we're very clear that at some point we're going to have to go in a different direction. In those first couple of days we tried and then we pivoted and we know exactly who they pivoted to. They, the the cornerback market was not what people thought it was going to be. So James Bradbury suddenly was available. Slay was about to get cut and then he's suddenly available. So yeah, those players are older. They're going to be both over 30 by the time this year starts, but it's a position they frankly value more than safety. Yeah, we had that discussion uh, maybe two weeks ago. All things being equal, would you rather have CJ or Bradbury? And mm-hmm. I think I was I was Camp Bradbury and you were Team CJ. Make a case for either one, um, but you couldn't. And have- I don't think. Yeah, and I don't think the Eagles decided on Bradbury. I, I yeah. think it ended up just being the way that things played out. Yeah, you must have loved. How many times did Howie say pivot? Like. I know it's one of your favorite words. Every time we have a staff meeting or something, Dave uses all like all the corporate buzzwords you can think of. Uh, <laughs> so all the all the uh, you know corporate people, you know, oh, oh he said pivot. <laughs> how we how we must have said pivot like nine times today. So I'm, I'm sure you were loving that. It's a good buzzword. Every time someone says it now, because we have that kind of inside joke, I chuckle. When it's not a <laughs> chuckling situation, like why are you chuckling? We're talking about million dollar contracts, and I'm giggling in the corner. Well, that's that's Dave Zangaro for you. He giggles in the corner. 
<laughs> but yeah, so uh, we look, we've known this was coming. Howie's known it was coming. Um, they were going to lose players, and and they did. Yeah, and I, I think he brought up the, uh, the point that like you can't just go into this with one plan because things are different than what you think they're going to be. Like you can try to predict it, and I think good teams do that, and they do it at a relatively high rate. But ultimately, like you're controlling one thirty second of the league, and, and you don't know exactly w- what's going to happen with those other teams. And you can try to predict it. And I think they're right on this one. They've been wrong before. He'll admit that they've been wrong trying to predict some markets before. It happened to be that they were right in this one, but ultimately it, it led to the player not being here. Now, I did try to pin him down a little bit, and I asked a very direct question about if they had a chance to match that offer from Detroit. And he said, I, we talked so much. I'm trying to think, did we have a – like?" I, I think that it's pretty clear that when it didn't work out initially, CJ wasn't coming back here. And, and I think some of that might have had to do with like if he comes back – on a deal that he feels like is not up to his value, a place that he he already played for, didn't value him the way he thought he should be valued. I think then you have to worry about like what kind of situation does that create in the locker room, in the building? And I, I think they were cognizant of that at least. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. And, you know, I mean, how he had really had, had no choice um, because you snooze, you lose in these things. And, I mean, I would have loved to have seen him come back, but the more we hear, the more you realize just um, – and, and I, you know, I don't blame CJ. I, I think there's a point where he should have kind of read read the tea leaves and understood what the market was for safeties. He might have been a little late. Well, he pays someone to do that who didn't do it very well. That that too. But, yeah, just when I say he, I mean he he and his, mm-hmm. his representation um, really misjudged it. And, like, day one, you don't know. You, you don't know, but um, – you know, once it was pretty clear that the market for safeties wasn't, and the market for him uh, wasn't what he anticipated, um, that's the time to that's the time to move and cut your losses and and take the best offer out there. And and he just kept waiting and waiting, and best offer ended up being yeah. not that great. Yeah, and it's his first time going through this process, so I know he was obviously hoping to cash in, and we were wrong too. I mean, we thought he was in sure. the. You know, at least ten, eleven million dollar a year range, and he didn't come close to that. So uh, you feel bad for him because this is like his chance. To, but maybe he'll he'll have a chance to cash in next year. I don't know. It's hard to imagine his value being higher, but it's not in the vacuum either. So yeah. the, the whole market for that position could change. We've seen, yeah. you know, I think like tight end was a, like a position was like really held back for a long time, and then a few guys busted through, and it, it changed the game a little bit. Maybe safeties do for that. You know, there's just so many, so many things can go wrong. And if you're waiting for that next contract, uh, it's not a place you want to be. You get hurt, you have a bad year, uh, you don't get along with the coaches, you get benched. I mean, we've seen all this stuff happen. You can suffer, you know, a, a significant injury and just not be the same player. Um, these things happen, and that's why when when you get a fair offer, you take it. <laughs> I mean, unless you're unless you're really really sure that you're going to come out ahead in the long run. I just don't think it makes sense to to play that game. Uh, look, it's easy for me to sit here and, and second guess, but I've seen so many players. Gosh, I saw Bobby Hoying turn down a huge deal and never won another game, never made that money. Um, you know, Byron Evans uh, turned down a huge, huge deal, the linebacker, and got hurt, never played again, never, never made that money back. Um, we've just seen so many guys. Those are – old examples because they're just the ones I thought of, but there's a lot of examples. I mean, even Zach, Zach Ertz not that long ago yeah. had an offer on the table and he didn't take it because it, it was under market at that point, but bit, he, yeah. he quickly, he quickly showed some decline and he wasn't worth that anymore. So it's, right. it can, it, you can, you can end up making money doing it that way, but you also, you're incurring the risk at that point. Yeah. I guess it's like playing the stock market. Do you want to be conservative and know what you're getting or you want to, you know, be super aggressive and, and you might lose a lot. You might you might gain a lot. It's not really like it that much, but it's a little bit like it. <laughs> <laughs> I get your point, though. I, yeah. I, I'm following a little bit. Uh, yeah, so that I thought that was – it was worthwhile that um, we heard that from Howie and uh, about as transparent as he can be on that topic, I think. Yeah, I was a little surprised how detailed he was. And, and Dave mm-hmm. will have a story tomorrow. You can read everything that he said and uh, all the – all the details, but yeah, it was interesting stuff. 
Yeah. And I thought it was also interesting in that was the first question uh, when we started our, our interview session with Howie was about CJ uh, and on his own, Howie brought up the quarterback contract. And I, I thought that was notable, too. Uh, we didn't have to ask him about it. He brought it up. Uh, let me read this real quick. I, I won't read a lot of it, but um, it's no secret that sometime relatively soon we want to extend our quarterback. Our whole kind of roster building is going to turn a little bit here from a quarterback on a rookie deal towards hopefully a quarterback on a long term deal. Not that we have anything done or anything, but that's obviously our goal is to keep Jalen here for a long time. So everything they do this offseason is with the idea that they're going to find a way to lock up Jalen Hurts long time. And there's been nothing to make us think that that's changed or that this deal won't get reached. Now, it, it takes a while. These are, you know, it's a mega deal you're talking about. But um, gosh, it's such a perfect day. For him to talk about this when the Lamar Jackson trade request, that news comes out as John Harbaugh's at a table over there getting swarmed by media asking him about it. Like you never want to end up with your franchise in that type of position because like how do you even mend that at that point? No, yeah, I'm not sure you do. Um, talk about agents. It's a guy who – I'm not a big fan of agents, but that's a guy who could use one, uh, Lamar. But um, I, I thought um, – I thought what Howie said about um, – let's see if I can find the quote, and I probably can't. Um, uh, just about – you know, obviously there's other quarterbacks that are up. Um, he he really seems to think that they're not a factor in this negotiation. And I'll just read the quote real quick. Um, at the end of the day, we're not looking – he says that all the time at the end of the day. That's a big – that's a huge a crutch. You know, who's start, you know, Zach Ertz actually started doing that. Like every quote was at the end of the day. Um, like what, what does it matter at midnight? Like what, what is that, why is that important? Um, we're not looking at anything but what's fair for us and our players. I think that dynamic about what everybody else is doing, we have to do what's best for us. I don't know that we necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about when we're doing it based on other teams. But that was really interesting. It's interesting. I also don't completely buy it because like, I, I don't think you rush it to beat those other quarterbacks, but I think it would help. I think it would help to get it done before Joe Burrow gets a deal or before Justin Herbert gets a deal. Does him saying that somehow mean that they have agreed on some of the major major numbers in this deal? No, I, I don't think it means they've agreed on it. I, I mean, I, I think he has the framework well, in that's his what mind. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Well, that's different than maybe not agreed, but just that that, that there is a general framework of money that I two, think so that the two sides are working within, and, and I think what he's saying is that whatever happens with someone else, that's not going to change. Yeah, not not drastically. At least I think it could change a little bit. Like I think like in terms of guaranteed money, like if one of those guys gets like a mostly guaranteed deal, then like all of a sudden this is a, a very different conversation. I don't think it's going to happen. Probably not. I, I mean, happen. the Sean Watson contract a couple of years ago was the one where everyone thought, Oh, what's this going to do for the rest of the league? And we, I don't know if we know that yet. Um, yeah. I don't think, I don't think it'll start a trend. We'll see. We'll see, but uh, yeah, but uh, it's. I, I think the overall tone was. I don't want to say encouraging, but positive. No, I th I, th I would say that I, I would go encouraging, no optimistic. Encouraging. Yeah, yeah I, I think that it's like it's very clear that both sides want to get this done. And yeah. when you have will on both sides to get it done, like, and, and I don't think the eagle and, and how he's been truthful, I believe, about like not trying to get a great deal for the Eagles. It's about like really trying to make both sides happy. Um, you're not trying to pull one over on your franchise quarterback. You don't want him in a year to be, think he made a mistake agreeing to a deal. That That's not a good situation yeah. for either side. Like that, that, uh, that first feeling of like winning for a GM, like that quickly subsides and you have a quarterback who regrets signing a deal. Like that doesn't do you any good. You, you want this guy to be here for the next decade and, and win Super Bowls. So like, I think that he's very truthful about that. And I think in a lot of ways, quarterback is like different from some other positions where you, you might be willing to quote unquote win a deal. I don't think you want to do that with the franchise quarterback.
No, absolutely. And uh, I think the relationship is so good and so healthy. And I think the negotiation will be a positive one. And I, I just don't see that happening. I, it, I mean, anything's possible. Gosh, I remember covering a guy who wanted to renegotiate before he even <laughs> even signed his contract. It, it, it was Keith Jackson. We were having a presser for him, and he had signed a low ball deal. And he was like, "Yeah, you know, if if I have to renegotiate this deal, you know." And it was like, I "Haven't even signed it yet." Harry yeah, Gamble's not a good start. Harry Gamble sitting there with his hand over his face. But anyway, um, yeah, and and you know, I think Howie was Howie was like, you know, we want to get this done as soon as possible. But um, he made the point that there's no no deadline. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no reason to to rush anything for either side. It's going to there are like it. some there are some like soft deadlines. Like I think the start of the season could be a soft deadline because some some players won't want to negotiate during the season. They won't want that distraction. So I think like ideally you'd get it done in the summer, even maybe before training camp. Before yeah, he- I guess when I said no deadline, I, I meant kind of in over the next few months. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would say. I would say opening day, certainly you want to get it done before he's out there playing a the game on a minimum yeah. wage deal. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and even, and even maybe before training camp, because there, there's, even though he's got a red Jersey on, there's some risk about being out there. He's not going to practice practices. without a contract. I, I would guess. Really? Yeah. He'll have like an ankle or something. <laughs> Interesting. I, I don't know what would happen in that case. I, I think surprised. it'll be done before then. I think it'll be done before then, but if it's not for some reason, I don't think he'll practice. I'll probably be on vacation when it gets done. That's normally the way this works. That's not true. It's only happened one time. It was Fletcher Cox's big contract, and it still bugs me. Why? Because I got to write it. <laughs> no, I, I I felt like I missed news. Like, and it was I was even like, where was I? I was in I was at Yellowstone. So like my like I'm off grid. And I get back to, you know, my phone later at night and I like, I missed it. I just missed all this news, this giant mega deal. Missed it. It's how much faith Dave has in my ability to cover a story. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You know what I mean? Like, you just feel like you're out of the loop. Yeah. You sound like Zach Berman. <laughs> Some, someday. And he'll probably tell the story. And uh, I think on, on his podcast about um, he was on a first date with, uh, with someone and the big news broke that G.J. Kenny had signed with the Eagles. And oh, I've heard this story. Yeah, yeah. You guys ask Zach next time you you see Zach or tweet to him. Ask him. Ask ask him about the G.J. Kenny story. <laughs> I, I don't want to tell it. It would be. It's not yeah. my place. But yeah, it's along those lines. Now you just have people walking up to him. Rubat wanted me to ask you this. <laughs> I hope so. I hope that happens. Yeah. Uh, anything else from Howie? Let's uh, like th- this whole notion of running it back. I-, I thought he had some good points about why it's not a huge concern. Did that uh, interest you a little bit? Yeah, it did. Um, and it's something I just wrote about. And you know, I started off writing about it thinking, yeah, I don't know if you had a chance to read my piece. It might have uh, just a few days ago. Kind of started out like you know, oh, they're they're in big trouble. And then like you know, you take these deals each one individually and. <laughs> None of them really concern me. So uh, they're all players who are still above average, and they could decline a little bit, and they couldn't decline a lot. But when you look at the options they had at those positions, with and we're talking about the whole, you know, five guys who are in their thirties, but including Bradbury, will be. Um, yeah, it just doesn't doesn't concern me that much. Um, Interesting. I and, and I also think like they're right at a certain extent, like to run this back. They had the best roster in football last year. And like yeah, the guys think, were talking the guys yeah. were talking about like haven't shown precipitous decline. Like even Fletcher, who's shown decline, like didn't like he went he ticked up last year. Like BG yeah. ticked up last year. Slay, yeah. you can probably down a little bit, but Bradbury probably up. Like I, I don't think it's like across the board, like they signed all these declining players. And if you didn't sign them, who are you gonna get to replace them? Like Fletcher Cox has this ten million dollar deal, which sounds like a lot. But it's less than he got the year before, and like, look at the market. Like, I, and like, had, you know, people are down on Fletch. He had the six most sacks among interior linemen in the league last year. And I know it's not all about sacks, but um, he was fine. He was. Fine. I think we've reached the the Jason Peters point with Fletcher, where he's not what he once was, and he's a victim of his own success. Could be. He's still a good player. Um, he's now, not- I used to say that about Jason Peters, and he really fell off a cliff. So maybe I shouldn't use that again. 
He did. But he was but also Jason, older. But, but there, yeah, and there were moments where, like, I thought Jason was played well. There was a period of time, like, between when he was elite and when he fell off, where he was playing good. He was playing good football. But and I think it got lost. Yeah. And that hasn't happened with Fletch. No, he, he missed a snap or two, but no, he he's out there every week. And it's important to remember. And, you know, Kelsey's still the best center in, in the game. BG is, is a top 10 edge rusher statistically with 11 sacks, and he's getting $6 million, which makes him vastly underpaid for that position. Um, you know, you talked about Slay and Bradbury. Um, you know. I think in, both under market. Yeah, yeah. For three-year deals, yeah. You can argue all the players, like their old guys that they've kept aside from Kelsey, are under market. I wouldn't even argue that. They are. They're under market. Yeah, that's that's true. That is true. Fletch considerably, BG drastically. Uh, but, you know, you, you you factor in the age too. But sure. as far as just performance, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's – I think – and I think I wrote this is it's these weren't emotional decisions for Howie. These were smart football decisions. These were still guys who can play at good salaries, uh, fair salaries and made sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you on that. And then like the guys they've supplemented it with, I, I like the, how he used the term lottery tickets today uh, because that's what they are. Like all these deals for these players are super cheap. And there's like five of them, right? You have Penny, um, Greedy Williams, Justin Evans, uh, Terrell Edmonds, and Nicholas Morrow. So five of those guys, all really low-risk deals. And like if one or two of those guys pans out, they feel pretty good about it. Yeah, and they're all guys who – I mean, they're all guys who have cheap contracts, um, high ceilings, but certainly – um, each one of them has either had injuries or mainly injuries. I mean, that's really mm-hmm. what most of them are. They're just injuries. Uh, they've never, for the five, were first or second round picks. Yeah. Um, I think Morrow was undrafted, right? I undrafted, believe. yeah. Yeah. Went so, to a small yeah. school, yeah. Went to a D3. Yeah, Greenville. And wow. I had a hard time. Fit. There's like three Greenvilles, and I was writing that story, and I was trying to figure out which Greenville he went to. And Illinois, right? Yeah, but there's other Greenvilles, and I wasn't sure, and I wanted to be sure. And, like, a lot of college websites don't say where the college is. And so I was on the Greenville, Illinois. I was on the right website trying to find out where it was. And Just they scroll had some, to the bottom to find the address. They didn't have an address on there. Oh, that's weird. So I, I, I clicked on the facilities page and found the name of the tennis center, and I went to oh. Google Maps and asked it where the – whatever tennis center is and it came up in Illinois. So that's how I knew I spent like way too much time trying to make sure I had the right Greenville. Anyway, um, they're all, they're all guys who there's really very little risk. There's not going to be, if they don't work out, there's not going to be huge cap hits or dead money. They're one year deals. Um, and if they play well, um, you found something at, at a, at a low price and maybe, you know, you try to resign them, although it's going to be hard. <laughs> I don't know what if they're they play do. really well. They just you're at they're at your price at that point. Yeah, yeah. And try it again. Yeah, um, if this yeah, it's going to be there's going to be a lot of these one year deals. Um, trying to find guys that, um, you know, I mean, this year all the one year deal guys play pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, remember like uh, back when. Um, the Eagles signed, they had that run where they signed like Rodney McLeod and Brandon Brooks. Like they figured out that at that point they were like, yeah, we want to sign these guys who are like 26. We want to sign them the multi-year deals. But then like after they did it that off season, they had like relatively um, cost efficient deals. Like they were big deals. Like I think Brandon was like five for 40, which is like a big deal, but it's not like crazy money and it was worthwhile. After that off season, like those types of deals, you had to overpay. So like, I really think how we kind of pivoted his direction with with the target in mind for for free agents and said, all right, well, we're gonna we're gonna try to keep our guys who are in the building because we can probably get them for lower than market, and then we'll supplement that. You have to obviously have those players in house to make it work, but then we'll supplement that with a bunch of these flyers on players, and maybe once in a while you're you'll add a, a blue chip guy like Hassan Reddick, and even that was under market, but like you'll add pieces like that. And I think it's, it's a wise strategy because 
you're not getting Brandon Brooks anymore for five years, 40. Like those contracts are gone. Yeah. Yeah. And to make that work, you've got to really be good at evaluating talent. Mm-hmm. You've got to, you've got to nail those under market deals and they've, they've done that. I think Rodney and Brandon Brooks signed the same day here. I believe. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big day for the organization. Organization. It was organization. Yeah. In Calgary. Uh, anything else from Howie that, that stood out to you? No, that was, uh, you covered it. We covered it. I covered it. You covered it. (laughs) We covered it. I think that's the the way to say it. We just didn't find my Amex card. Maybe Howie's got it. Should I ask him? (laughs) God, I can't imagine what he would say. Um, But if if I see a bunch of charges on there from, uh, you know, like with dead cat money on my Amex card, I'll know know he found it. (laughs) It was a five-year deal for uh, like a a pack of bubble gum. (laughs) Catch all the sports action at more at Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Whether it's the money line or the pass line, there's something for everyone in the great sports book. Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Philly loves a winner. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Rube, this is our first podcast since Terrell Edmonds signed and since the Eagles gave that extension to Lane Johnson. I know some people were like, do an emergency pod, do an emergency pod. I had a pack, so we didn't do an emergency pod. We'll do it now. Uh, let's start with Edmonds. Um, Does it take you a long time to pack for a trip like this? Well, for this one, yes, because I'm staying out here for a while after. So I had to like pack for two trips, which is tough. Okay. So you have to pack your work stuff and your. Yeah. And it's like very different stuff. Yeah. Like I'm in like kind of you know, like. Nice you polo when you're out hiking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not exactly. Uh, yeah. So I had to like pack two separate, very separate suitcases, gotcha. which was weird. Yeah, but I knew exactly where to go to get the rental car. Yeah, yeah. When we when we were in the airport, um, it was only a few weeks ago, but uh, we we got Dave's car in the in the rental car lot. That was interesting. We saw your car sitting there. Oh, oh, yeah, like my my make and model. Yeah, and so we not had, my car. Well, it seemed like it was. Yeah. Like Dave knew where everything was. You know, like I need where's this button? Where's that? But whatever, Dave. It was like driving Dave's car. It was kind of weird. It was helpful. Anyway. Yeah. Terrell anyway. Edmonds. Yeah. Uh, what'd you make of that? He, he's a big name player, former first round pick, has started 75 games in his career. Now the the fit, like on like the actual fit on the field is a little interesting to me. He's been kind of a box safety who he's played a little bit in other positions, but primarily plays in the box. And based on what we know about Sean Desai, like they like to have a little more interchangeability but you're talking about a really cheap deal for a guy who's played a lot of football and is still pretty young yeah uh 75 career starts um a solid guy i think when you have this kind of cap situation you're not going to be able to get ideal fits for for what you want to do you're going to get the best available guy and then try to you know fit around peg in a square hole a little bit and i think uh, i think you'll see that but i think out of all these guys He's a starter, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how that works because, uh, like you said, he's you know coverage is not his strength. Um, although you know you take the PFF grades for what they are, um, his were okay. You know, his were actually higher than CJ, which I don't really understand because um, he had fewer interceptions in five years in Pittsburgh than CJ had in twelve games here. But coverage is more than just interceptions, as we know. Um, so I'm really curious to see how he fits in. He'll be one guy to really keep an eye on um, at, at training camp, not so much OTAs, but training camp, and um, just see how that part of his game looks. Because we know he can, we know he can stop the run and and play up at the line of scrimmage. I'm not concerned about that. Um, the other part of his game is a big deal, and see how he does. Yeah, I, I thought though, like you, you looked around, and that was the, there were the safety market was so depressed this year that there were names out there. It was him and Adrian Amos and and, and all these guys who you thought, okay, like one of these guys is probably going to end up here, and it ends up being Edmonds. And if I were to tell you that he has the same amount of guaranteed money in his contract as Greedy Williams, like that's pretty shocking that they were able to get him for that price. And I'm not saying he's like a a great player and all pro, but a guy with a pretty high pedigree. 
Yeah, I was I was really surprised how low that contract. I think the others kind of were in the range I expect. I thought this one would be a little higher. Um, and he's a guy, he, he played his rookie deal with the Steelers. They didn't exercise his option, but he went back there on a one-year deal. And it sounded like he had, you know, I mean, he, he just never considered going back again. And um, kind of a, I, I think that's kind of what you said when things go bad, maybe you just you want a fresh start. And uh, I'm really curious about him. It's like, he's, he's not, I mean, he's not TJ. He's just, you know. But um, CJ, uh, CJ, what did I say? Okay, I was yeah, I thought you meant like TJ Edwards. Like no, yeah, of course CJ, not I just TJ. said the wrong okay. initials. I got you. not yeah. CJ. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it, you're not going to get you. You're not going to get a guy like that. So I think you just have a guy who's really solid, um, and he's not going to he's not going to miss tackles, uh, but he's not going to make the splash plays either. Yeah. And I will say as much as I, I think the Eagles did prioritize keeping Gardner Johnson and then they pivoted to Bradbury, I think it is easier to like have a lesser safety and hide a lesser safety than it is a lesser corner. Oh, there's no question about it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm fine with that. I'm excited to see how he plays and if it's him and Reed Blankenship, which I guess if they lined up tomorrow, that that's what it would be. Uh, at least you have some experience out there where if it was like he couldn't go into a season with Reed and, and Kayvon Wallace. No, no. And, and yeah, that's, that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, Kayvon got a little better in coverage. We saw him make a couple plays, but I, I, I don't think he really is. I don't think he'd be in the mix. They might say he's competing for a job, but I don't see it. Um, and Reed, you know, Reed was better in coverage than I expected. Um, he was pretty good in coverage. He was solid. Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe, maybe it'll work. It's there's, but there's, uh, I mean, all these guys are like big question marks. Every one of these one year guys is like, you know, if Penny stays healthy, if, um, if Edmonds, if uh, all of them really, if they all stay healthy, yeah, for, or maybe well, not Edmonds, Edmonds. That wasn't the problem with him. He's yeah. always been healthy. Yeah. The other four. Yes. Yeah. The other four. That's, that's really the issue. Um, yeah. I'm, he's one guy. I mean, I think him and Penny are the most intriguing to me as far as, Really want to see what they're all about in camp, and with Penny, just can he get through camp healthy? And, yeah, yeah. Know. He's the guy, though, that I'm like, I can't wait to watch because I think we'll see it pretty quickly. Like, if he still has the burst, if he still has the athleticism, and then it's just about like keeping him on the field. But I think we'll notice pretty quickly whether or not he still has his legs. Yeah, I mean, he's had a lot of injuries, and mm-hmm. we've seen guys. Yeah, you wonder, like, if at a certain point that would matter and it hasn't yeah like every time he's been healthy he's been really good it's just he can't stay healthy yeah and a lot of lower body injuries so you wonder about his legs but uh yeah i can't wait to see him uh out of all those guys him and and Edmonds are are the two that i would think they're you know have a chance to make the biggest impact yeah all right the lane johnson extension so it's they tack a year onto the contract so he's now under contract through 2026 adds $33 million to it. And and I had a lot of questions coming in from people like, why would they pay him $33 million in 2026? And that's not the way it works. They they basically added the year, they added the money, and now it's like a new deal, basically. Like you you can't think of it as I'm adding $33 million in 26. That's that's not the way this works. And we expected some sort of movement with his contract at a certain point because he had a cap hit of $24 million and that just wasn't going to work. So whether it came through a like a kind of basic restructure where they pay out some bonus money and, and spread that cap hit out, or an extension in this case, uh, we knew something was going to happen. Yeah, and it's funny because he was talking about playing two more years, and he still might play two more years. I'm sure the Eagles, I'm sure Howie's hoping that's not the case, but uh, it's hard to imagine the way he's playing, playing better than he ever has, even with the injury. Um that he would really seriously think about, you know, stopping. So um, this doesn't really, this doesn't guarantee anything about his future, but it kind of, kind of tells you what he's thinking maybe a little bit. I, I wrote a piece, well, I think it was in my 10 observations about the hall of fame. I think that's something that now becomes a real possibility with lane. Um, if he makes two more all pros, which it's not a lock, but at his, at this point, I think, with his reputation now, he's finally kind of 
gotten to the point like Kelsey, where as long as he's playing well and stays healthy, um, he's going to have a good shot at all pro every year. Mm-hmm. And if everyone who's made four all pros, every tackle ever has, has made the whole fame at some point, except one guy who, I don't know, he, he was involved in a, uh, in a murder suicide and never was considered for the hall of fame. Uh, it's an awful, awful story, but um, everyone else is in the hall of fame. So, you know, Lane is like Kelsey because he didn't start getting those honors till later in his career. Um, but I think he really had to overcome that, you know, the the narrative that he was a product of banned substances, which I think he's done. He's played six years without a suspension now. Um, he knows that another one – that's still – another one is still two years, right? I mean, that doesn't – Yeah, it would end it, yeah. Yeah, it would end his career. So uh, I, th- I think, you know, and, and that if he's a Hall of Famer, which isn't that out of the question, that would mean Stout would have coached three of them here. <laughs> Which is – it's insane because uh, I think JP is pretty much a lock. We know Kelsey's a lock. Um, they should just put Stout in if all three of those guys get in. That's fair. And, and the Lane – other thing Lane's had a fight too is the perception of the right tackle. Yeah. Because for so long it was like you just stick a, a guy out there, a big fat guy at right tackle, and you, you have a good player at left tackle. And, I mean, in the course of his career that has changed drastically. I mean, they drafted him to take over – after JP at left tackle and JP played forever. Uh, but then like you saw the value in it because pass rushers are playing on that side. And, and like there was, what year was that? 2016 or no, it was 2017 maybe where he just went through like, it was like Von Miller, Khalil Mack, like back to back to back to back. And he shut them all down. And he's done that now for the last five, five, six years of his career. He just shuts down everyone. It's amazing. So um, I think he's really like the perception of that position has changed, but He's one of the big reasons it has. It's fair. Uh, I don't know if I said this on on Huddle or on our last pod, but I, I really believe that playing at such a high level with that injury brought him a level of recognition that he never had before because that was a huge story at the Super Bowl. Here's this guy with a torn adductor muscle playing right tackle at a championship level, at an all-pro level. And you couldn't tell. I mean, there was a couple of times you could see him kind of wincing or just fidgeting physically. You, you, you knew it hurt. Uh, but from his play, you couldn't tell. So I think, I mean, every time I walked by the lane podium or lectern, whatever you want to call it, he, he had like 50 media around him. And he was telling the story about, you know, this is why I'm doing it. This is how much it hurts. <laughs> this is when I'm having my surgery. And it became one of the bigger stories in Arizona. And I think that really, ironically, that injury, I think, brought him a level of notoriety they never had before. Yeah, that's interesting. And very well deserved. Like him and Slay are the two players on this team who I think are, um, I don't want to say like more respected by other players, but I think sometimes the level of respect they get from opposing players and players around the league doesn't always mesh with the accolades or fan perception. Like, I don't know if there are two players on in that team on that team that are more uh, highly respected than Slay and Lane around the league. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I mean, I think that's true of all those older veterans, you know, BG, Kelsey, Fletch, but uh, certainly those two are at the top of the list. Yeah. Uh, I don't have much else today. We're going to talk to Nick Sirianni and Jeff Laurie on Tuesday. Got caught up with Dougie P today. Oh, how's Dougie P doing? Doug's doing great. I had a chance to ask him about what it was like to watch the uh, the Super Bowl. <laughs> had to be weird for him, right? Like, it's not just the Eagles playing, but the Eagles playing Andy and the Chiefs. Like, yeah. he has so many connections on both sides. He said, like, from a rooting perspective, he just just hands off, <laughs> happy for whoever wins it. But it had to be a really weird deal. Like, so many of his players were in that game. Yeah. Also talk to him about um, the trip gonna, back. I think they'll be yeah. pretty good next year, but yeah, go ahead. The Jags? Yeah. They should be very good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they were already a playoff team in the first year. The quarterback has a really bright future. I think Doug's in a good spot. It, yeah. It's good to see Doug look like Doug again because we talked so much back in 2020 about he was a shell of himself by the yeah. end of that. So it's, it's nice to see him look healthy <laughs> again and look happy again. And 
I think it was important for him too that he came back to Philly and he got he got that out of the way. It was like a, it was a cool moment for him. I think he appreciates it because like I think he, look, coaches get fired. Andy got fired, right? Like it just it happens. But um, I think you want to have a certain level of respect and you want him to feel like he can come back there and, and get that reception. And I think it was a good moment for both sides to have that happen. Oh yeah. There's no question. That was a special moment. Uh, it was cool to see because look, this, this is a tough city and they don't embrace a lot of people that leave the way they embrace Doug. I mean, the guy coached the Super Bowl champion, so they should. It was, it was cool to see. Yeah. And every time that uh, the photo comes out of all the head coaches, you just go, and half these guys were in Philly. <laughs> Where was Nick? I didn't see him in the photo. Yeah, he didn't make the photo. I don't know. I'll have to ask him why he wasn't there. Uh, maybe he just missed. It. I don't know. It's if he if he did it on purpose, it's a power move. I don't need yes. no stinking photo. I guess. I hope. I hope that wasn't the case. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention: uh, Frank Lamaster uh, passed away Thursday. Um, really good player. Uh, played nine years linebacker here. Um, Drafted out of Kentucky in the fourth round in '74. Started every game from '74 to '82. So he was on. The, he was a starter on the Super Bowl team in '80. Uh, made his first Pro Bowl in '81, um, and he was at OTAs uh, in June. And I got to meet him and spend some time with him and talk talk to him. And what a nice guy! And um, just one of those guys. I you know I tweeted about him and like all these people. Hey, I met him at a sporting goods store. He was doing an appearance in 1984, and I met him. And every no, you know, everybody just had the nicest things to say about him. And that was my mom's favorite player. And um, so it was. Uh, it was really. It's a sad. It was a sad day. And uh, it's just super nice guy. Um, you know, it's funny. He he's from Kentucky. He grew up in a farm in Kentucky, um, but he settled in Chester County on a farm because he said Chester County. Uh, the far, the rural part of Chester County reminded him of Kentucky. So he lived here after, and he went to the 49ers. He was in training camp in 83 and got hurt and retired. Uh, never played for them. Uh, but he came back, came back here. He worked for Field Turf, actually, for uh, the company that puts in fields and, and worked for them and then retired from that job and settled in, in Chester County, lived the rest of his life here. So uh, condolences to uh, to Frank's friends and family and a great player, a great guy, and uh, he'll be missed. Well said. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. That's it. For Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye. We'll talk to you soon.